Okay, so finally we can actually launch into our discussion of modulation formats. So this is covered in section 4.2 of our textbook from SCLAR. So as I mentioned previously in the introduction, there are two versions. There is the baseband version with no carrier and the passband version with a carrier. So just to, uh, to recall again, in baseband, here is the uh, spectrum centered at DC. Uh, this is the frequency. And of course, these are positive frequencies and these are negative frequencies. We all know that negative frequencies don't really exist, but this is a mathematical construct which well describes um, a manipulations in the frequency domain. So here is a baseband and there is no carrier. And if we have a passband system, well in that case we'll find some center frequency and we will put our information um, spectrum uh, centered on this carrier frequency. Now notice what's interesting is that now um, the bandwidth here in positive real frequencies is twice the bandwidth. Here in baseband systems, of course the real bandwidth is only from here to here. And the rest is just the mathematical construct that is easy for us to manipulate with the Fourier transform. But what's really great about the Fourier transform is it predicts that when we use a carrier, when we move this, when we modulate it, when we take the signal, and we modulate it with a carrier, cosine 2 pi f 0 t, well, indeed, what we will see is this uh, spectrum. So, just uh, a re re reminder about what it means to have a carrier. And uh, all the modulation formats that we're discussing can be used either in baseband or in passband. Uh, we won't mention that again because the representation in signal space is the same whether it's in passband or baseband. So all of the mathematics that I'm going to introduce to you is based on a signal space analysis which treats, which can be used for either of them. The really only difference you have to keep in mind is that it's true that baseband is more spectrally efficient perhaps than a passband version. So modulation, the motivation uh, for modulation, different types of modulation formats uh, is because of the di different situations that we're confronted with. And that's one of the reasons why carrier um, modulation is so important, why we use carriers. So these are for applications such as wireless, where antennas are important. If I tried to send a baseband transmission with an antenna, it would be huge. I couldn't put it on a, a um, cellular telephone. Cellular telephones, we want them small, handheld, and therefore the frequencies we operate on are much higher. So if we're at like 2 gigahertz, um, or um, excuse me, uh, yeah, something in the gigahertz range, then the antennas can be quite small. Uh, however, if it's a lower uh, carrier frequency, they'd have to be larger. So these are motivations for why we even use carriers, because we can make our antennas small. We also might want to uh, use uh, frequency division multiplexing, which means that I might have a certain bandwidth, and in, so perhaps I am a um, Rogers or TELUS or AT&T or some uh, uh, mobile provider, and there might be a certain frequency range that I have paid money for to have the right to to exploit this frequency range and I want to support many clients and so one thing I can do is each client can be given a portion of this frequency band and so I have to use a carrier to place them at different points within this band so carrier modulation very important for sharing the spectrum and for having small antennas so as I mentioned, we're doing signal space analysis, so it's valid for the uh, uh, carrier modulation. And in essence, in the signal space analysis, the basis vectors in signal space take into account this carrier. So for instance, when we're going to be looking at our signal space um, basis, we're going to often come up with a basis which has cosine omega zero t, sine of omega zero t. So if I have, you know, one of these uh, channels and it has some 
frequency associated with it, then the basis uh, functions that I would use for this signal would be cosine of omega zero t, sine of omega zero t. Because this happens so often, we have a vocabulary that we have we use to easily discuss uh, this basis, and we call this the in phase part. The cosine is the in phase part, and the sine part is called the quadrature part. So there's uh, two basis vectors, the in-phase basis vector and the quadrature basis vector. So let's start out with our first modulation format, and this is phase shift keying, also known as PSK. What I'm going to start with here is a representative, um, an equation for each one of these signals in the space that I'm going to be uh, looking at. And so I have a carrier-based uh, system here. So I have the omega zero T, which represents the modulation by a carrier. Uh, capital T is the time of a symbol. So in this case, um, excuse me, the information is actually coded on the phase. So here's the frequency of the modulation, and here is a uh, the data. And the data is going to be in which angle, which phase I'm using uh, with this carrier. So I can put it out of phase by zero, out of phase by pi over two. I, I have many choices. And in each one of those different kinds of phases I sent, that represents a symbol in my constellation, in my alphabet for my transmission. So we typically use um, Say I have M symbols in my constellation, I have eight symbols in my constellation. I'll usually take two pi and I will divide it into eight equal segments. And then this uh, I, uh, I just step through uh, two pi over eight, four pi over eight, six pi over eight, etc. I'll just step through them. So they're equally spaced around the um, unit circle. So the E in this equation is the energy per symbol, and the T in this equation is the symbol time. So uh, if I were going to look at a signal space representation, this is a modulation with the carrier, and so the, I would choose basis functions, which are the cosine of the carrier and the sine of the carrier. So if I use these as my basis function, uh, for instance, I could find the signal space for BPSK, bipolar, uh, excuse me, um, binary phase shift keying. Binary sh phase shift keying, one of the angles is zero, and since m is equal to two, the other one is at pi. So here's zero angle, and here is pi angle. So there's two angles uh, that represent um, the uh, two phases used for modulation. In this case, you know, I don't need a sign because it's a binary with a, um, it only needs one basis vector, so I don't need two basis vectors. But if I have more than binary, if I go to m array signaling, m PSK, uh, then I would need the uh, two basis vectors. So what's interesting is that it's a two-dimensional space no matter how many symbols we have. So no matter how big this M may be, all I need to represent the signal space spanned by phase shift keys symbols is uh, these two basis vectors. So here are all the symbols, and all of the symbols, no matter what phi I'm putting in here, can be represented as a um, linear combination of cosines and sines. So that just comes from the trigonometric uh, relationship. So what's really nice about signal space is I can get some intuition very early about this kind of modulation format. So without doing the mathematics we're going to have to do uh, to get some uh, quantitative, uh, quali uh, quantitative results on performance, let's start thinking about some qualitative performance metrics. So what I have plotted here is the signal space represented uh, representation of MPSK. And M in this example is equal to 8. So I have eight points, and it's in a um, circular uh, geometry. And we can see that um, the angles are divided so that it's t 2 pi divided by 8. Every 2 pi over 8, I have another one. Imagine if m was 16, then there would be 16 um, equally spaced 
symbols around the unit circle. Uh, pi over uh, m equal 4, there would be only four of these. I'd get rid of uh, maybe these four. So you get the idea of how we would view MPSK in a two-dimensional signal space. Basically, uh, these, mm, let's go back, they all have the same energy, right? That's how I know that it's the unit circle. They're all equally distant from the origin because they all have the same length, right? And the only thing that differs is their uh, angle. So now I have a geometric uh, um, uh, representation, all the same distance from the origin because that's the way PSK is, is defined. It's got equal energy for every symbol. What would happen when I start to make this larger? So here is performance for um, eight, or this is, sorry, this is a diagram for eight. Uh, imagine that I start making it 16. So now I add uh, twice as many points. And what I'm doing is when I add more, when M is getting larger, I have smaller distances between the points. And if I make it 32, it'll get smaller again. So, uh, excuse me, I can um, see right away that making M bigger is probably going to deteriorate my performance. Because remember, in signal space, I know that when I add noise, noise will create like a cloud around uh, the, each one of the points. Instead of getting just one point every time I transmit, what I get at the receiver is this point displaced a little by noise. So I get many different, every time I send this same signal, I have a little different noise, and so I end up getting something that looks like a cloud around that. Now, the m bigger M is, the closer they're going to be. So even if the noise stays exactly the same, when I make M bigger, well, because they're close, you know, the cloud around here is going to be hard to tell from the cloud around that one. So I'm going to have more errors. So before I do any quantitative analysis, just from using the signal space representation, the geometrical um, representation of this modulation format in signal space, I know right away that larger M is going to compromise my performance. So let's move on to the next modulation format that we're interested in. That's known as frequency shift keying, or FSK. And here is the representation, the equation, which describes modulation FSK. Uh, in this case, again, um, we have some offset, but the offset doesn't have an index of i. The index of i now is instead on the frequency. And the frequency is where we code our information. So it's like I have in the frequency domain, I pick this frequency to be, um, I could do it for binary, it could be a logical zero, and this frequency could be a logical one. Or if I have, you know, more than, than one, uh, I could have a whole bunch of frequencies and each one represents a different symbol. That's what FSK is, is, is about. So there are um, M distinct frequencies. Each one of these frequencies is one of the symbols in this constellation. Again, the E represents the um, energy and we can see it's the same E no matter which symbol we use. So these are equal energy symbols. And of course, T again represents the, the time of the symbol, uh, symbol duration. Now this theta, um, really I just keep it there to remind us that there will be a coherent detection and an incoherent detection. In a coherent detection, I'll know what that theta is and it'll be like it's zero. But in a non-coherent detection, I'm not going to know what that theta is and I have to sort of keep track of the fact that there's some, some unknown phase that, that might get in the way of my detection. But for now, I'll just say that the important thing to remember is that each one of the points in the constellation is called uh, a, uh, is a different frequency. So in this um, modulation format, we typically have basis vectors, which are the cosines of each 
uh, one of these different frequencies. So there's some collection of frequencies, m different frequencies, distinct frequencies, and each one of those is like a carrier, and so each one of those is a basis vector. And for now, we'll just assume that beta equals zero uh, when I give my examples so that we're talking about coherent detection. Uh, of course, typically also m is a power of 2, so nothing uh, too surprising there. So for the signal space representation of FSK, it gets very complicated because it is no longer a two-dimensional signal space. Now if I have m uh, symbols in my constellation, I have m basis vectors. So m basis vectors, so it, it becomes an m-dimensional space. And in this m-dimensional space, it's hard to draw it. <laughs> so I'm going to take 3FSK as, because it's three-dimensional, and first of all, our intuition is very clear on three-dimensional space, and it's a little easier to draw than, than trying to draw a four-dimensional space. So let's look at this three-dimensional space, which represents FSK. So I know that the um, each uh, uh, symbol has the same energy, because that's in my definition of FSK, I gave that E. And so that represents the distance from the origin. So for example, here is the uh, vector for S2, and it has a certain length. When I do the vector for S1, here's the vector for S1, and it has the same length. And uh, if I have another uh, vector for S3 here, um, sorry, this also has the same length. Really hard to see that, I'm sorry. But they all have energy E, and so they all have the same length, and so they're essentially the vertices, uh, three vertices on this cube. So I have a cube here, and the corners of the cube represent the, um, here maybe I can see this one, yeah that one's a lot clearer, uh, represent um, the three um, symbols in our constellation. So, okay, the three corners in a cube. Understand that. So, I can um, ask the question, you know, M is the number of symbols in the constellation, it's also the number of frequencies, and the dimension of the space is determined by those, so there's dimension M, as I mentioned earlier. And now I ask the question of you, what happens when I add another one? What happens when I add uh, a fourth uh, symbol in the constellation? We saw for MPSK that increasing M led to closer spacing of the um, uh, symbols. But now what happens when I add, well, let, maybe going from three to four is too hard, but let, let's think about what happened when we went from one to two when we had, or from two to three. Here is for two, we would have had S1, and we would have had uh, S2. So that would have been two-dimensional space. And we look at how far apart they are. And now I go to, I add a third one, so I add a third dimension. And how far apart are they? They're the same distance apart. Nothing has changed. I've added another dimension. And now if I look at this new dimension, how far apart are them? They're actually exactly the same distance from one another, just by the, the symmetry of the cube, right? So what happens when I, this is going from two to three, didn't get any closer, they didn't get any closer to one another. In fact, they're all the same distance apart. And when I go to four, I can't draw a four dimensional cube, but we can imagine a hypercube of dimension M with many, uh, each one of these symbols on a different corner of this hypercube and they're never getting closer to one another. They're never getting closer to one another. So that means that the distance between them is the same, which we know that that means the performance will be the same. So as I go to higher M for FSK, there should be no hit on the performance in terms of bit error rate versus SNR. So this is a big difference between um, PSK and FSK. So that might be one of the reasons that these two different kinds of modulation exist, because they have very different kinds of type of uh, behavior. And in certain situations, we might want one behavior or, or another one. Now I had this idea of manipulating the phase, manipulating the uh, frequency. 
uh, the next thing I can do is I can manipulate the amplitude. And manipulating the amplitude, we've seen previously, and we called that pulse amplitude modulation. You might see it in another textbook called amplitude shift keying, but they're the same thing. The idea is that I have a carrier. Pam, I can have a carrier or not, but uh, let's say I have a carrier, and now the information, each time the data is sent, it's the energy that is changing each time because the amplitude is changing each time. So in this, we typically take evenly spaced discrete levels to represent the different amplitudes in our uh, modulation format. One example would be on-off keying. And the on-off keying example, um, one of the levels is no energy at all, and then we'll have an, another uh, amplitude level, so zero and something non-zero. This is not necessarily the most high performance modulation. It's not, we're going to look at the performance of it, the bit error rate versus SNR, and it's not going to be as, as, as good as some of the other ones, but it is like really, really simple. So it's less popular in terms of its performance, but sometimes cost can justify that reduction in performance. So let's look at some amplitude shift keying examples. BPSK is actually also uh, an example of PAM modulation because it could be uh, negative amplitude or positive amplitude. So that, that's, m we're manipulating the amplitude. We could have looked at it as being phase zero and phase pi. That's just another way of looking at it. What's nice is when we look at signal space, they both look the same. <laughs> I can call it any name I want. I can think about when I implement it, to implement it by changing the amplitude or to implement it by changing the phase, but uh, the analysis is the same. But imagine now that I go from uh, a binary modulation format to a quaternary, so QASK, uh, or 4 PAM, we might call it also. Uh, what you'll notice is that um, when I'm drawing the spacing in signal space, I'm being careful to use a normalization um, that's appropriate. And so we'll be talking about that. But uh, I'll just throw out to you the correct uh, normalization of the space. And we'll notice that as uh, we're adding, m is getting larger, that the spacing is getting uh, smaller uh, between the amplitude levels. And, and this uh, fall off is why the performance is not quite as great with PAM modulation as it is with some other modulation formats that we'll be looking at. So the important thing to realize also is that in this example, the symbols are not at the same distance from the origin. I have two symbols which are close to the origin and two symbols which are farther apart. So these are you know, non-equal um, energies, which we can see in signal space means that they're not uniform distance from the origin. So the previous two examples, phase shift keying and FSK, were both equal energy for all symbols, but here the symbol energies are different. But I still use this ES to represent the average energy per symbol. In those other modulation formats, there's one ES that they all use. In this one, there's an ES which is the average. So if I were to, I said this is the correct normalization. If I was going to take the, calculate the average uh, energy per symbol in this constellation, it would come out to ES, because that's what ES represents. Again, the impact of larger M, because of this normalization, every time I add an M, it's going to make the points closer to one another. In fact, I could go from the energy per symbol to the energy per bit if I wanted to make sure that I could understand uh, this comparison between the EB in this binary case and in the quaternary case, and then maybe it's even clearer uh, where this um, things getting worse comes from. I guess I should also have mentioned that this was a one-dimensional space. For ASK, it's a one-dimensional space. I have only the cosine, which represents the um, carrier, and everything is happening on the amplitude on that one uh, basis vector. So the fourth modulation format I want to mention is this combination of both amplitude and phase. So instead of restricting myself to being on the unit circle and only manipulating phase but leaving the amplitude constant, or 
limiting myself to a single line where I don't play with the phase and I only let amplitude change, now I can think of uh, letting amplitude and phase be modulated. And so sometimes this is called amplitude phase keying, but much more often we're going to see it under the name of quadrature amplitude modulation. So here we are where we have this combined uh, representation of what we saw earlier. So we have a uh, index which says what the phase is and it also uh, is an ordered pair. I have to specify both the amplitude and the phase in order to specify a particular symbol. So again we have discrete levels of the uh, amplitude and the phase. Um, we'll see that this is a very bandwidth efficient modulation format and one of the reasons that it is uh, so popular and, and, and uh, in extensive use. In this uh, modulation format, once again, the typical basis vectors would be the cosine and sine of the carrier. So we're manipulating the phase rotation, which is why we need a cosine and sine in this case, and also the amplitude. So this is a two-dimensional space because we have two basis vectors. Uh, so the size of the space, remember, we saw earlier that the size of the space is n, and that n will always be uh, smaller or equal to m, the number of symbols. So we've seen an example in FSK where n is equal to m, and then we've seen examples where uh, n is smaller than m in the case of phase shift keying and QAM and PAM. Uh, PAM it's uh, n equal 1, and for phase shift keying and QAM, n is equal to 2. Uh, one last point, it is unequal energies of course, for these uh, different points because this uh, amplitude is changing. So we'll be looking at QAM more extensively uh, later, but now I'll just point out that uh, it's a two-dimensional space, so I can plot it in two dimensions, and there are many different geometries. Uh, in class, we'll be developing equations for rectangular, very regular, um, Mm, let's just call it rectangular geometries, and often in the exams I'll throw at you something that's a little more variable, hexagonal, triangular, circular, uh, some other geometries which for which there aren't usually uh, standard equations that we use, but we'll learn the techniques uh, to find equations for the performance of these other modulation formats. But for now, let me just uh, tell you that, you know, if we had m equal 4, uh, rectangular quam would be like a square with four points on the square. If we have m equal eight, we'd get a rectangle. And so you can see that um, there would be um, something like a, a, um, eight different phases and maybe um, four different um, amplitude levels. So we can pick any geometry we want for QAM, but this regularly spaced levels is a typical uh, choice for QAM. Uh, m equals 16, we'd have another square, 4 by 4, uh, m equal 32, m equals 64. So 64 quam uh, would be using all of the points in here. I just want to mention now, why do we call it a constellation? Well, you can see it looks like stars in the sky. That's why we call it a constellation. So now I've introduced to you all these different modulation formats. And what we have to attack are different scenarios. We can look at the binary case, and we've looked at the binary case in some of these. Well, we've seen binary PSK, ASK, but we want to extend it to the MRE case. We also have to examine this two possibilities of coherent or uh, non-coherent uh, detection. So the binary and the coherent, we've already looked at for actually all of the cases. You may not realize it, but we're going to see that uh, having dealt with on-off keying and antipodal, that's really all four of them when I just use the binary because a couple of them are equivalent. So we've really done this part already, uh, but we have to extend it to the MRA case. So uh, for coherent detection, um, when we say we're going to do coherent detection, uh, what does that mean in terms of our uh, receivers? So here is the received signal coming in, and the first thing we're going to do is to uh, demodulate it, and that typically means to uh, remove the carrier frequency. And this is 
coherent detection, which is used for both PSK and FSK, um, and QAM as well. Uh, the form of the receiver in the binary case we look here, uh, we would take uh, a correlator structure that we've seen already. So we've seen the correlator structure uh, for the binary, and you can see here that we have the difference between the uh, two symbols, which was our we would use for demodulation. Then we would do the correlation by taking the integral in order to come up with a test statistic, which is compared with the uh, threshold. So this basic form applies to PSK and FSK. Uh, binary QAM is also PSK or uh, PSK, so, so it's really the same thing in the binary, binary case. So what we have to attack next, of course, is the MARY and the coherent. That's what we're going to do uh, in the next round. The non-coherent um, is going to be a little more difficult because, as I mentioned, it has non-Gaussian noise. And so it's kind of tricky to do the analysis, so we're going to limit our analysis to just uh, PSK and FSK and uh, uh, keep it simple and binary in those cases.